Turn to hymn number 377. 377. Rescue the perishing. Let's stand and we're going to do all four verses y'all sing out this morning. Michael, would you lead us in prayer this morning? Father, thank you for reminding us again that you rescued us from perishing. Thank you again, Lord, for what we heard in our Sunday school classes this morning. Again, Lord, we look forward to what you would have for us today. May you be receptive to what you have for us. May the Holy Spirit have free course among us. May you again give us what you would have for us through our pastor. And Lord, just bless everything that is done that might honor and glorify Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> hey, good morning. Good morning. How's everything going all right? Yeah. Is, is it good to be in the house of the Lord or what? Amen. It is. I'm glad to see all of you. And um, just a quick question, too. I know we have one, but uh, any of you that are first-time guests, we've got a packet of information we'd like to get to you. Would you just raise your hand now um, um hope and maddie yeah they've got a friend from work uh right back there beside hope and uh i met him early this morning and refresh my memory on the name 
Damani. Damani, Damani. Yeah, y'all understand when you get to be my age, <laughs> your, me your memory leaves. Amen. But the Damani, again, it's, we don't, th this is not the time to amen. You do that during the sermon. But Damani, good to have you, my friend. There is a, uh, an information card in there. If you don't mind, uh, if you've got a pen, just to fill out, you know, your contact information and uh, just put it in the offering plate when it's passed. We'd really appreciate that. Uh, we'd like to be able to keep in touch with you if we're able to do that and love to have you come back and be with us as many times uh, as you can. It's good having you. Okay, let's not pick on Damani anymore. Uh, we'll move on. Uh, you've got a bulletin full of important uh, announcements, but I'd just like to highlight uh, three of them. One that is not in there is uh, the prime timers have an event this Tuesday morning at nine o'clock at Shoney's. So, I mean, you know, if you're like 55 or, or older, even if you're younger and come, I, nobody's gonna complain, but uh, it's gonna be nine o'clock over at Shoney's and we wanna encourage, it's a time of fellowship uh, for some of the, us older folks, you know. So I hope you'll make an effort to, to be out there this, this Tuesday morning. Uh, again, at Shoney's this Tuesday morning at 9 o'clock. And then please read um, the, the announcement. If you are a daughter or a mom, you are invited to, to, the, to the last uh, WIC meeting. And that's to take place this coming Saturday at 13. It's going to be a potluck luncheon at noon. Uh, but read the rest of the information there, if you would. And then uh, there's been a lot of interest generated lately for updating our church directory, and Linda Ayers is going to be heading up that effort. Right now, she is over with the uh, Children's Church in the Fellowship Hall, but if you would like to help out in that effort, please get with Linda after the service. Let her know you'd be glad to do what you can. Uh, to, to help uh, this production come to pass. And I would like to say, and I'm really excited, we've got Brother Joe Oryx back with us for the summer. Uh, he's been in college all year, but he's back. And uh, he's really, you know, he's, if you don't know him yet, he's got a real fire for the Lord. He's studying for the ministry. He's going to be a good influence uh, on our church while he's here during the summer. And we'll make sure that you hear from him at least a couple of times while he's here. We'd like to have him preach. But uh, it's good to have you back, Joe. It's good to be back. And uh, in the choir, too. A little uh, fuller sound this morning. And we've got uh, uh, our choir's a little fuller than it yeah. has been in recent weeks. Y'all sounded great, great in that opening uh, hymn. Okay, enough talking for now. Uh, I got plenty of talking to do in just a few moments, so we better move along. Brethren, if you would, go ahead and come, and we'll receive the Lord's tithes and offerings today. And Brother Randy, I'd like to have you to ask God's blessing on this offering, if you would.
and stray, wander far away. I can hear you say, come to me and rest. Though the path be rough and rugged, though the trail be dark and steep, still the gentle shepherd watches o'er his sheep. There's no need to fear when the shepherd's near, when your voice I hear, I find comfort sure. Free from all alarm, sheltered from all harm, safely in your arms, I can rest secure. With a flock abiding, all my needs supplying, comforting and guiding, leading all the loving shepherd you'll forsake me never in your flock forever I am not alone though the darkness hide me you are close beside me, gentle shepherd, guide me till I'm safely home. Till I'm Pray. 
with us now, all ye children of God, rejoice in the Father above. Worthy is he of our worship and praise, and worthy is he of our love, is he of our love of thee. We sing, O gracious God, thy glory we proclaim. Of thee we sing, O gracious God. Of thee we sing, O gracious God. And magnify thy name,
I've got to tell you, all the music has been a particular blessing to me today. It's just what the doctor ordered. Uh, the specials, the congregational singing, y'all sound good. And, uh, the, the, you know, the two choir numbers after the offering, I mean, the first one was good for as long as it lasted. I mean, I, you know, sounded like that was going to be a good one. And then we, you know, cut that off and went to the second one, which was really good. Uh, Y'all don't even know what I'm talking about, do you? Huh? Y'all, are, are, is, okay, who's awake? All right, well, I, see, I see maybe five or six hands. I'm in trouble today. Julio, longtime friend of mine, talked to him a few days ago and asked him to come be with us, and he said he would. He's a man of his word. I knew that. You invite so many people, they never show up. But I knew I, I knew Julio would, and uh, he's a he's a, lar- a yard and landscaping uh, guy. And I've had him do a number of things for me, but he's he's very good at that. And well, I'm just glad to have you here this morning, Julio. And uh, well, anyway, let's let's go to John chapter three. Uh, for the third and last sermon from this chapter. The last couple of Sundays we've been talking about Nicodemus, but we, you know, we'll be moving on to a different theme this morning. I'm sure you're familiar with the text in verse 30 of uh, John 3, where John says, He must increase, but I must decrease. So the title of the message is, He must become greater, I must become less. We'll be looking at verses 22 through 30. <clears throat> anyway, uh, your continued prayers for me are greatly appreciated. Uh, I, I was feeling a little unstable and tired Wednesday night. Brother David Ellinghausen, uh, on short notice as usual, filled in for me, and he's a very dependable guy to call on. But uh, I am bringing my blood sugars down. Uh, it got a little bit high and uh, saw my doctor this week. And so things are headed in the right direction. I'm still a little bit cloudy, a little bit weak. And, uh, I, I, you know, there's a part of me, I mean, I remember what Paul said. He says, when I am weak, then I am strong. And, and I'm rejoicing that because uh, when I, you know, when you don't feel that, that hot, uh, God really has to take over. And that's, that's a good thing. And uh, I've, tr- I've asked him to take over this morning, and I hope this will be a blessing to you. You know, this portion of John's gospel opens up with a note of intrigue. It's kind of that, it, it, it is the kind that sometimes sprouts from devotion to a good cause. The problem that we're going to get into in this passage came from the fact that there were two groups administrating the baptism of repentance. There was, first of all, the group that our Lord Jesus Christ led now at the present time. In verse 22, it reads, After these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them and baptized. But as you know, the disciples of John were also baptizing. In verses 23 and 24, it says, And John also was baptizing in Anon near to Salim, because there was much water there. And they came and were baptized, for John was not yet cast into prison. So two groups were publicly doing the same thing. They were baptizing. I don't know if you've ever paid that close of attention uh, to the potential problem here uh, in the last part of chapter 3. Uh, but anyway, you got two different groups that are baptizing people, and the only, the only difference, <clears throat> according to John 4, 2, is that the Lord Jesus Christ himself was not personally bap- uh, administra- administering baptisms, but uh, some of his uh, disciples. <clears throat> anyway... The rub was that John's ministry was being eclipsed by the ministry of our Lord. 
And the loyal disciples of John were jealous uh, for John, and they felt threatened themselves as well, and things soon came to a head. Uh, an argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. You see that in John 3.25. And we don't know the details of that conversation by any means, but apparently the Jewish detractor was saying in so many words, well, which baptism is superior? Is it John's or is it Jesus? Confusion was high among the disciples of John. And they came to John and they said to him in verse 26, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth and all men. Notice what they, they're exaggerating here. And all men come to him. And again, this was, you could tell they were emotional because this was nevertheless an emotional exaggeration because not all were going to Jesus to be baptized. There were still a fair number that were coming to John the Baptist. And so, but, but basically, the concern of John's disciples was this, Rabbi, your star is sinking your ministry is diminishing. What in the world are we going to do now? So the implication was that they were not going to allow John to take a back seat uh, to anybody. And uh, the disappointment of watching the ebbing of a ministry that had once been a great flood tide, along with angry protest over those who were turning away, was all a very human reaction on the part of John's disciples, and it presented a temptation to John himself. You know, John the Baptist, he had spent many years of loneliness and self-denial uh, in the wilderness. And no doubt on many occasions he experienced rejection and an alienation uh, from his culture. And now having experienced headline success, he saw it suddenly beginning to fade away. Now that's the context that's important to understand here. And so, um, you know, it would have been easy for John to just yield to a very natural impulse to assert himself at this particular point. You know what? No matter who we are, and no matter how much success we're having, sooner or later, our lives or our ministries are going to be eclipsed by somebody else. I mean, that's just the fact of the matter. The most successful, competent, or famous will one day be asked, to take a lesser role, and we all need to know how to react at such a time, right? So the text we are studying in this chapter is important because there is a, a regrettable competition among Christians even today, and it's always been that way. Uh, one of the greatest examples is the experience of the Apostle Paul and what he had to go through when he was under house arrest in Philippi, you read about it in Philippians chapter 1, verses 15 through 17. And what was it that Paul said there? He said, some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. While he was in prison, Paul, the missionary statesman of the early church, learned that some were proclaiming Christ out of selfish ambition. In fact, that word translated contention literally means political ambition. 
And if you haven't learned this by now, even in churches, sometimes even in good churches, there are a lot of politics at play. And that's never a good thing. Um, so there's a great deal of competition in the Church of Christ today. Maybe there's some of that here. I hope not. I feel like I know the caliber of people that we've got here, but I, don't, I can't read every thought of your heart. we just got to be humble enough to serve God, and uh, it's not about us. It's never been about us. It's all about Jesus Christ and God the Father and His glory. So there's a lot of competition between churches today, and that includes a dislike of some preachers for other preachers. Sad to say. And very few things give the enemies of Christianity an occasion for blasphemy like a jealous, jealous party spirit among Christian people. So this passage has a contemporary impact, and I think, Maybe it should be mandatory study for all of those that are going into Christian service. Um, it's vital for everyone who names the name of Christ to understand what is taught here. Our competitive society is structured to compel us to measure our achievements against those of others. It's the way it's always been. That's how the world determines success. And that, but as we go through the text, particularly verses 27 to 30, we will give passing reference to its primary or vertical significance, where John says he must increase but I must decrease, but also to the horizontal significance of what is implied in that statement. Because we need to have the same attitude toward our brothers and sisters in Christ. They must increase, but I must decrease. So consider, first of all, in verses 27 and 28, the proper philosophy that we need to have. Y'all are good so far? Because we've only got an hour and a half to go. So. I figured that would wake a few of you up that were asleep initially. But uh, no, we'll let, you, we'll let you go before then. Don't worry about it. But the proper philosophy. You know, John stood before his angry and excited disciples and he quietly answered their resentful assertions with a proverb that's recorded in verse 27. And what does it say in verse 27? And I'm going to re be repeating this phrase, man. This thing is burning in my brain and heart. This is what John said. So much wisdom. And this will help you so much if you get it. Get what? This. A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. I was really blessed uh, by the selection and the way it was done, you know, by Brother Michael's offertory special. Um, not everybody's going to be able to sing like Brother Michael. So are, are we to get jealous about that? Uh, the, the reason why he can sing, and, and we've got some... We're a small church with a small choir, but our, our choir, man, I'd put it up against, you know, anybody. I mean, we got some good voices. We have good voices in this choir. Uh, not everybody's going to be able to sing like that. That's why not all of us are in the choir. But, I, you know, it, are, are, does that irritate us? Are, are we jealous because of that? No, you know what my feeling is when I hear Michael sing, when I hear the choir sing, I'm, I'm thinking, praise God, more power to him. You know, more power to him. 
I, I don't need to be the one. I, I, I'm an older man. Hopefully I've matured some of the faith right now. I, I, I don't need to be the one in the limelight all the time. I don't need to be number one at Calvary Baptist Church. You know, I, I, I want to see credit to whom credit is due. If any good thing happens around here, it's not necessarily because of me. It is because of God's people here. But we're all working together. You know, we want that kind of a spirit among God's people here at Calvary Baptist Church. And so, again, did, did you hear what John said? Uh, you may not... You may be irritated because somebody outshines you and you think, you know what, uh, I'll never admit it, but deep down inside I know they're more talented than I am or they're more charismatic than I am, better personality, better looking than I am. And yeah, you know, I, to think about it, I just get all bent out of shape. Well, if John the Baptist were here, he would tell you this, a man can receive nothing except to be given him from heaven. So you are what you are on purpose, by God's purpose, for a specific ministry. You've been made uniquely. You may not have all the qualities that are necessary to do one thing, but maybe God's telling you that's not what you need to be doing. Maybe you need to be doing something else. Don't sweat it. Let me tell you, I, when I was going to Bible college and seminary, and I've shared this before, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of ashamed to say it, but I, I, met, I had friends and some brethren there that, um, you know what, they, they, they weren't very eloquent when it came to speaking. Uh, they, they stuttered, they stumbled. They didn't seem to be super swift mentally. And in my private thoughts, and shame on me, and I, I would never say this to anybody, but as I would see them walking by, in my private thoughts, I would think, you know what, I'm, I, I'm more gifted. I, I got more ability than that person does. Now tell me you've never thought that at least once in your life, right? Right? I, I could, I, you've, you've thought, you know what, I can do this better than that guy. But you know what, these, these guys I thought I was so much more superior to, they had a, a character and a deep love for God, and they may have walked slower than I did, but they kept plodding, and they wouldn't let anything stop them. And the fact of the matter is, many of these old friends that I thought I was better than have surpassed me in the ministry. I mean, I can give you specific examples. Guys I never thought would do all that well have excelled in the ministry of the Lord. A man can receive nothing except to be given him from heaven. That is, on a human level, a man, if, if a man is displaying gifts that are superior to mine and having greater success than I am, it is because God has given those things to him. And so that, a proper philosophy, we need uh, to understand what John is saying so that we can properly evaluate the success or successes of other people and not be jealous not be irritated by it. You know what, I'm, I mean, this is human nature. And hopefully as you grow in the Lord, you get over some of this stuff. But there is an unhappy human tendency to play down the successes of others and to uplift our own successes. You know that to be true. And if someone's doing well, we just attribute it to the fact that maybe they were born with a silver spoon in their mouths or they were just at the right place at the right time, timing's everything. But if we happen to be particularly successful, it's because of our prowess, our intelligence, and our hard work. 
But the proper philosophy by which to evaluate our own successes is to remember that a man can receive nothing except it be given to him from heaven. You know what the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7? He said, For who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now, if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory? As if thou hast not received it. In other words, you just had something inherently. No, what we get, folks, we get from heaven. The abilities, the gifts. So whether we are looking at ourselves or others regarding success, the proper philosophy is, and I'm going to say it again, a man can receive nothing except to be given him from heaven. Will you all remember that phrase when you leave here today? If not, when you come back tonight, I'm, I'm going to say it, I'm going to say it 10 to 20 times more. I'll find a way to get it into my sermon tonight. Because I, 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 we need to remember that. You know, John... John was good. John grounded his philosophy. This is important. It may not sound that profound to you, but John grounded his philosophy about life and his own personal success uh, his, and, and it affected his perspective. John had a very high view of God as the sovereign bestower of gifts. He understood that. You can tell that from the statement. He could tolerate being outstripped by another because he knew that God never makes a mistake. And I've seen this truth. When people come to understand this like John did, when they come to understand that a man can receive nothing except to be given him from heaven, uh, it, it, it sets them free. It takes so much pressure off of their lives. Of equal importance is that John's philosophy seen vertically and grounded in an overwhel- was grounded in an overwhelming desire for God's glory. See, John realized, y'all still with me, right? I hate to keep nagging you. But that's what I do best. But anyway, um, in Numbers chapter 11, verses 26 to 29, it gives a perfect example uh, of, of John's philosophy from the life of Moses. Let me read it to you. But there remained two of the men in the camp. The name of the one was Eldad, and the name of the other was Medad. And the Spirit rested upon them, and they were of them that were written, but went not out unto the tabernacle, and they prophesied in the camp. And there ran a young man and told Moses and said, Eldad and Medad do prophesy in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of Moses, one of his young men answered and said, My Lord, Moses, forbid it! You know what Moses said unto them and unto Joshua? Envious thou for my sake? Would God that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. See, that's the proper philosophy when it comes to church work. That's the way we need to think as we work together. I mean, even Joshua, with all of his wisdom, was shaken by jealousy, and Moses replied, Are you jealous for my sake? I wish that all of God's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. Moses had seen God's glory, and it gave him great joy to see others catch a glimpse of that glory and exercise their spiritual gifts. I think it's no wonder that we read just a few verses later in Numbers 12, 3. Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. 
we need more meekness. The spirit of John the Baptist and the spirit of Moses were very much the same. They were two of the greatest men that ever lived. And we can easily see that, God, that, that John applied the philosophy of Moses to his own life. You know, in verse 28 of John chapter 3, we find these words, Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ but that I am sent before him. John answered that he knew who he was. No confusion about that. He saw that God had sovereignly appointed differences between himself and the one who outshined him. The one he was free to serve. So in John's life, there was no tinge of rivalry, no jealousy, no insecurity, no bitterness, though his followers were having problems with these things. John was not. And although John and Jesus were only a few miles apart as they were baptizing people, Jesus was having much larger crowds. And greater things were being said about Jesus and his ministry and, but nevertheless, John stuck to his appointed task, his God-given calling. See, that's what makes verse 30 even more significant when you begin to understand everything that went in behind that statement, he must increase, but I must decrease. That's not an easy thing for a lot of people to say. That is not an easy thing for perhaps over 50% of God's people to say. I don't know. You got to be surrendered to say that. So as you sit here this morning, do you feel outdone, outclassed, eclipsed by somebody? by a brother or sister in the Lord? Has someone come into your life who is obviously more gifted or more effective? Someone you are finding difficulty accepting? You need to remember something. A man can receive nothing except to be given him from heaven. Have I said that before? When that heavenly philosophy is operating in our lives, it produces security, joy in God's work, humility and freedom. How liberating it is to have a proper philosophy of ministry. Second thing we need to look at, and these last two points uh, will be briefer than the first one, but it's important that we have a proper attitude as, as well. Verse 29. He that hath the bride, uh, if you're looking at verse 29, he that hath the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy Therefore is fulfilled, says John. So John portrayed his feelings toward the ministry of Christ in a superbly rich illustration, the Hebrew wedding. He said he was like, you know what John's saying here? John's saying, I, I, when it comes to Jesus Christ and, 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 the, and his bride, I'm like the best man. Now, he may not be Christ, but I'll tell you what, wouldn't you be satisfied to be the best man of Christ? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's not bad. He was, he was like the best man, like the friend who attends, the bride, who attends to the bridegroom. According to uh, uh, more of a Greek scholar, William Barclay, in his commentary, he wrote the, this. I'd like for you to hear it. He said, the friend of the bridegroom, or the shoshben, 
had a unique place at a Jewish wedding. He acted as a liaison between the bride and the bridegroom. He arranged the wedding. He took out the invitations. He presided at the wedding feast. He brought the bride and the bridegroom together. And he had one special duty. It was his duty to guard the bridal chamber and to let no false lover in. He would only open the door when in the dark he heard the bridegroom's voice and recognized it. When he heard the bridegroom's voice, he was glad and he let him in and he went away rejoicing for his task was completed. John the Baptist said he found his fullness of joy in his master's voice. We too are to find joy in Christ because it has a double joy for us, because as members of the church, we are the bride of Christ as well. On a relational level, this suggests that the proper attitude for fellow believers who outstrip us and surpass us in some way is to share Uh, the joy of their accomplishments, just like a best man. So is that how you feel about your brothers and sisters in Christ? Huh? We're supposed to rejoice in the successes of our brothers and sisters in Christ. This, and this is rooted in one of uh, the great metaphors of Scripture, uh, the body of Christ. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 12, 26, And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. So how biblical are we, saints of God? Humanly speaking, John the Baptist faced a temptation that could have easily overcome him. He had been at the crest of his popularity. I mean, all segments of society had come out to hear him. Some people even thought that he was Elijah incarnate. Uh, He even had the ear of Herod. I mean, Herod was listening to John the Baptist. But now as crowds have begun to diminish, yet, 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 he rejoiced. Is there any reason that uh, we read in Matthew 11, 11, these words from Jesus Christ? Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater Then John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. But of those born among men, he was the greatest. His humility was the the key to his greatness, just as it was with Moses. And it's the key to any greatness of ours, whether we serve in a great or small place. Or ministry. So we should rejoice in the success of others, for we are bound together in Christ. And please, please, please do not forget what Peter wrote to us in 1 Peter 5 6. Your time will come. But right now, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Right now we're just here to serve. Right now we're here to worship. Right now we're to deflect any glory that comes to us and redirect it to the one who deserves it, God Almighty and Jesus Christ. But it takes humility to do that. Last of all, in verse 30, I'd have you notice the proper conduct that is needed. And this has something to do with philosophy as well. Philosophy influences conduct. 
But here it is. Verse 30, he must increase, but I must decrease. I wonder what John's disciples thought when they heard that. Let me just say this, very simple statement. John says he must increase, but I must decrease. Saint of God, there is no other way to live for Christ than that. This is an operational imperative. It is a must, it is not an option. As William Carey, the great missionary, lay dying, he turned to a friend and he said this. He said, when I am gone, don't talk about William Carey. Talk about William Carey's Savior. I desire that Christ alone might be magnified. Again, is that the way we feel? Because if you really want God to use you, that's going to have to be your conduct, and you're going to have to have the proper philosophy. That was the spirit of John the Baptist, that Christ alone would be magnified. How are we to approach our eclipse, whether it is happening now or when it comes in the future? What is to be our attitude? There must be a willing exaltation of others' gifts and ministries and a rejoicing over the successes and the growth of our brothers and sisters in Christ. My wife uh, is a... well. She and I, we both love reading Spurgeon. A lot of y'all do too, right? At least some of you, Charles Haddon Spurgeon. I mean, that guy is eloquent, profound. Uh, I, I, do, I do struggle with envy every time I read Charles Spurgeon. I'm thinking, how in the world can somebody be so eloquent? have such a command of the King's English. But anyway, there is another author that my wife likes quite a bit, a man by the name of F.B. Meyer. How many have heard of F.B. Meyer? Several of you. Did you know that F.B. Meyer and Spurgeon pastored churches in London at the same time, though? Did you know that? And Charles Spurgeon at the time was preaching in the great metropolitan tabernacle. And as a young man, though dynamic and gifted, Meyer would stand on the steps of his church every Sunday morning, Sunday after Sunday, and, and he would watch all these carriages as they went by passed his church on the way to Spurgeon's. And that was very difficult for him. But he watched it patiently and graciously. Another story comes from the end of Meyer's life. When he was preaching in Northfield, Massachusetts at the invitation of D.L. Moody, G. Campbell Morgan was there at the same time. They were both slated to speak for D.L. Moody. And I don't know how much you know about uh, G. Campbell Morgan. He came along a little bit later than F.B. Meyer in his day. Uh, in the early decades of the 1900s, he was considered to be one of the great uh, expositional preachers in all the world. And I love, I love G. Campbell Morgan. Some of the best commentaries on the Gospels you'll ever read. But anyway, near the end of Meyer's life, uh, he was invited, along with Campbell, to come to Northfield 
uh, to preach at the same time. And great crowds came to hear Morgan. But very small crowds came to hear Meyer. The latter was not in his prime. Again, F.B. Meyer was growing old. He was in the process of being eclipsed by others. Morgan was in the full bloom of his preaching power. So Meyer came back to his cottage one night and he was feeling very sad. And he began to pray. And God dealt with him and later he was heard saying to people, the great F.B. Meyer was saying this, have you heard Campbell Morgan preach? Did you hear that message this morning? My God is upon that man. See, that's the attitude, the philosophy, the conduct that we need to have as believers in Christ. When we labor for the cause of Christ with those who are on the same team, our attitude should be they must become greater and I must become less. It was Paul who wrote in Philippians chapter 2, I'm on the last page of my notes, Philippians 2 verses 3 and 4, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Boom, period. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. You know, one of the most beautiful jewels in the treasury of the Old Testament is the story of Jonathan and David. After David's victory over Goliath, according to 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 1, uh, that verse reads like this, Jonathan became one in spirit with David and he loved him as himself. That commitment grew with time and Jonathan set himself uh, to make David the king. Although as the oldest son of Saul, the king of Israel, Jonathan was the heir apparent to the throne. Rather than pursuing his own interest and advantage, Jonathan acted as a reconciler between David and his father and literally saved David's life on occasion. On the day David finally became king, Jonathan couldn't be there because he and his father had been recently killed in battle. No one who has ever read David's morning cry for his friend Jonathan could ever forget it. In 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 26, David said, I am distressed for thee, my brother Jonathan. Very pleasant hast thou been unto me. Thy love to me was wonderful, passing the love of women. Jonathan was a dramatic illustration of the selfless spirit of John the Baptist, a man who, seeing another who was appointed for a greater task, joyfully accepts God's appointed design. You know, we desperately need more Jonathans in the church today that the work of God be not hindered. You must be selfless in the work of God if this church is to prosper. He must increase, but I must decrease. And you must become greater, and I must become lesser. Dear Father, 
If ever you pressed home the word of God that was preached from this pulpit, I pray that you would press this message home to the hearts of God's people. There probably needs to be some humble repentance on the part of some. There's been a great need for that in my life in the past concerning this matter. And I pray, Lord, that during this invitation that we'll spend some time in prayer with thee, that you would take a spiritual inventory of our lives to make sure that we've got the proper philosophy, attitude, and conduct. And if not, Lord, convict us and, and move us to the altar of repentance. And Lord, if there's someone here today that has never been saved and at this moment is not on his or her way to heaven, would you have them, give them the courage, Lord, just to come down the aisle and to shake my hand and to share with me their great need of Christ and salvation. And we will find help for their soul. Lord, in these closing moments, may Satan be utterly defeated and may you be utterly glorified. We pray in Christ's name, amen. The hymn of the morning, the invitational is I Surrender All, 307, 308. If God's spoken to you today, maybe you're not used to doing this, but it might be an encouragement to others. I wish you'd come to this altar prayer and do business with him. Let's make sure we're right with God before we leave here today. And right in our attitude toward our brothers and sisters in Christ. I'll tell you this as a pastor. If we're to go forward as Calvary Baptist Church, I need the help of all of you. This is something I cannot even begin to do by myself. And if I were, things would not be nearly as effectively done as they are when you pitch in and help. You're the folks that make the difference. If God's speaking to you, you come as we sing about surrendering all to him on 308. God bless you. It's been a great morning in the house of God for me. And you folks had so much to do with that. Just being faithful to the Lord. Seeing the countenance of Christ upon your faces. Witnessing the changed lives of Christ living in you. The hope of glory. I hope that you'll be back with us tonight. If at all possible. As we continue in our meditations of First Timothy, we're starting right there near the, right near the beginning of chapter 2. And it's all about the church. 
<clears throat> and uh, how the church needs to behave and what the church needs to do. So that's tonight at 6 o'clock. Again, um, our first time guests, two of them this morning, God bless you guys, man. Thank you for being here today. It's been an honor to have you. Brother Jerome, we like to hear you pray, brother. Would you pray now and just close us out in prayer?